Welcome to Clayland Baptist Church. How's everybody doing this morning? <clears throat> it is good to see you all in our worship service this morning. Uh, if you would, let's stand as we go to our Lord in prayer and ask that if you would to remain standing as we pledge our flags to the front. And uh, we'll go ahead and say this. We've been talking about it and talking about it, preaching about it, advertising it, and telling all of our friends and neighbors, and it's finally here. Brother Eddie, Miss Beth, glad to have you all with us as you lead our revival for this week. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Let's pray. Father God, what an awesome God you are. Again, Lord, again, we do thank you for the day that you've given to us, another opportunity to come into your house, to worship you, Father, to lift up our voices in song, our hearts in worship, for, Lord, our, our minds in prayer. <clears throat> and Father, today, as, uh, as we begin our revival, Father, I ask that you be with Brother Eddie and, and the message that he has uh, planned to bring and, Father, that you will speak through him to us. That, Father, it will be the word that we're looking for, the word that we need. Not, 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 just, not just for today, but, Father, for an eternity. Lord, that it will change us. That it will uh, motivate us to be the Christians that you have called us to be. So, Father, with these things we pray this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Brother Lauren. Good morning. Let us recognize our flags to the front, first to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. And you may be seated. Okay, good morning. Too bad it wasn't like yesterday morning. Man, yesterday morning was beautiful. Nice. Yep, yesterday morning was awesome. What I do with the video right there? Let me get my long range on here. <laughs> Our call to worship hymn this morning is found on page 242 in the little blue book there. All hail the name of Jesus. Good to see you all in our worship service this morning. If you have your bulletin, a few announcements that I'd like to share with you, and a couple I have that are not in the bulletin. But uh, first of all, 
Uh, our prayer list is growing long, and I would ask that you uh, take a look over that and see if there are any changes that need to be made. And if there are, if you would use or make those changes and use the tear out that is in the bulletin, and I drop that in our offering plate later on in our service so we can correct that. Also, it is good to have you with us. If you are visiting with us, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, we'd like to have a record of your visit. Again, if you would use that tear out in the bulletin and uh, fill that out and drop it in the offering plate that we can have a, a record of that visit as well. And again, thank you for being here. Uh, school time. Um, school has started back. Amen? Amen. Or oh me. I know the parents are saying hallelujah and the students are going, oh, <coughs> man. But anyway, school's back in session, and uh, we're taking up donations for school supplies uh, for the uh, Florida Baptist Children's Home over in Tallahassee. And if you'd like to uh, make a donation to that, again, use our offering envelopes in the pew ahead of you and mark on there Florida Baptist or Children's Home or some way that we would have uh, a record of uh, what account that is uh, going into to support. And, of course, the big one is this week is a revival. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Uh, Brother Eddie and his wife, Miss Beth, is here with us this week, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Guys, glad to have you all with us. And we've been talking about it for quite some time, and it's finally here. So uh, we are excited about that. And uh, so, again, we're going to be having a revival, of course, this morning at 11 o'clock and then tonight at uh, 530. And then mark your calendars Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Each of those nights it'll be at 6.30. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Now, I had a chance to meet Brother Eddie this past week, and, and uh, I was kind of telling him what we've been doing here to get ready for uh, this revival. And I said, Brother Eddie, I said, I actually, I think a revival has already started. And so it's just uh, it's going to be him picking it up from there. And uh, I don't want revival to end. I want it to keep going. So uh, let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, a couple of other announcements I want to share with you. One of them is, uh, as you well know, did y'all know we're having an election this year? <laughs> y'all heard anything about that? No, okay. No. Uh, yeah, we are. A, a big election coming up this year. And actually on the, uh, uh, on the Florida uh, amendments, we have a couple of them that I do want to draw your attention to. One of them is Amendment 3, which is uh, talking about recreational marijuana. Guys, we don't need that in our county. We don't need it in our We don't need it, period. But uh, I would encourage you to vote against that one. And the other big one is Amendment 4, and uh, that is uh, talking about abortion. And uh, uh, please do your research on this one. Um, it, it is, there, there are some things, the more I read about this amendment, the more, the more scary it becomes. But uh, just to give you a quick overview of it, uh, it eliminates uh, parental consent. So if your child is in school and wants to have an abortion, the school has the authority to take that child to go have an abortion, and you never know about it. You never know about it. So it eliminates that. Uh, it actually uh, promotes all the way up to late-term and partial birth abortions. There's a lot of things about it that, uh, that we do not need in the state of Florida. So I encourage you to vote against both of those. Um, and just vote in Christian standards. Um, but talking about pregnancy, uh, I do want to share with you this one. Uh, pregnancy Care Center uh, 2024. They're having a 5K walk run. For me, it would be a waddle, but that's okay. Uh, 5K walk run for life, October the 12th, 2024. And uh, for live vote, we'll meet at the uh, first federal sports plex. And uh, I will leave this up here. So if any of you would like information on the Pregnancy Care Center walk run uh, benefit, uh, that will be there. And uh, Tim shared with me this morning that uh, September the 7th, we need to mark our calendars for this. September the 7th uh, is going to, well, we call it a senior outing. I don't know why we call it a senior outing, because anybody that wants to is welcome to come. But anyway, September the 7th is our senior outing. At 1 o'clock, we'll meet at Sister's Cafe uh, down in Brantford. So uh, pretty good place to eat. Seafood buffet, right? Where'd Tim go? <laughs> My wife's over here. <laughs> All right. Tim, tell us about Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school this morning. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and say that from last week to this week, we had over 25% increase. Amen. Um, and I was excited to see these numbers when Marjorie gave them to me. 
We had 47 this morning in Sunday school with five visitors. Amen. And better class goes to Brother Eustace. Amen. Good job. <laughs> one more announcement. Um, need to mark your calendars for this one as well. Uh, it's going to be happening on uh, September the 21st. And it's going to be uh, at 2 o'clock here at the church. And uh, that is going to be the day that uh, Miss Sandra and Brother Steve are going to get married. Woo! Amen. So, uh, again, huh? Oh, to each other, yeah. <laughs> crazy, as, crazy as that sounds, to each other. Yeah, uh, got to add that. So, anyway, uh, mark your calendars again, September 21st, 2 o'clock right here at Clayland. And uh, so help them celebrate that union. All right, anything else? Good to have uh, John and Debbie back with us this morning. Hey, they've, been away, they've been away from it. They're, they're still newlyweds, too, so good to have them with us. All right, it is good to see you. Brother Lauren. Our next hymn this morning is found on page 68. If you're following along into the blue, 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 uh, blue, 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 blue book. Do you know my Jesus?
Amen. looking thing there mean now you know we was talking about a little song last week and it reminded me of this song it wasn't the song you guys were thinking of our god's an awesome god but this one comes close our god reigns
do worship and serve a mighty God. Amen. Amen. Again, it is good to see you all in our worship this morning. Um, I got to tell you, you have absolutely no idea how strange it was for me to be driving to church to Clayland this morning without a message in my Bible. Uh, the whole way here, I'm going, man, I just feel like I'm forgetting something. And it just, it didn't feel right. But it is good to be here in, in, uh, at Clayland and uh, for this worship service. And um, again, I want to go ahead and invite you back tonight and uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I look forward to see what the Lord has laid on Brother Eddie's heart. Now, we'll give you a heads up. I told him, I said, Brother Eddie, I said, you're welcome to preach as long as you want. But I said, most people leave at 12. So um, do it at what you want. Please welcome Brother Eddie Blaylock. <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I didn't clock. see Brother Lawrence just threw his uh, watch down the bench There's there. No but clock on the wall. No clock on the wall. Right. Amen. Now listen, I've been doing this a long time. I have been a pastor now for almost 49 years. Um, I know I don't look that old, but uh, yeah, almost 49 years. So one thing I know is that you need to stop when you're finished, right? <laughs> And the sooner you finish, the better people like it. I don't plan to be terribly long, uh, but I have some folks from our church here who know that sometimes I may go a little bit longer. But I promise you, I'll try very hard to keep within your time frames and to, um, yeah, to just do what you're accustomed to as best I can. Um, I, you know, one thing I believe, and that's this, because several people have told me that, now they propped you up pretty high, so we have a pretty high expectation. Now, the, the, the bad news is I'm probably not going to reach that expectation, but the good news is God's Word never disappoints. Amen. So I figure as long as I stay in the Word, we're going to be all right, right? And you'll just deal with me however all my quirks and differences and whatever it may be, you'll deal with that because it's the Word of God that never disappoints. And by the way, anybody that has their, their eyes on the man in the pulpit really has missed the whole point. It's not about the man in the pulpit, it's about the presence of God in the place. Amen. So what we're striving for this week in revival is to have the presence of God in this place. Revival won't come through Eddie Blaylock. Revival won't come through any preacher but it'll come through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God Amen. at work in this place. I will tell you, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and I'm um, really pleased to be here. And I really believe, I'm excited about what God's leading me to share this week, at least at this point. I tell Brother Bill, he knows this, that who knows, God, is, God does what he wants, and he'll, he'll arrange as we, he sees fit. But I am excited about some of the things that I want to share with you. Now, since we're going to try to, our best to be done in time, I better get started, okay? Because if I don't, it's going to mess up. Now, I've, you made, I've already made one mistake, and I just realized that when I got here, I may have to drink some of this water. I burned yesterday. Anybody done that the last few days? Burned house, uh, yard trash, you know, limbs and limbs and limbs and limbs and... Uh, and I did that yesterday, and so I, I, my voice isn't terribly strong, so I'll try not to, but I might have to uh, get a little help there. So if you have your Bible, I want, and I hope you'll bring your Bible, I want to start in Psalm 51 today. So turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 51, and it'll be a good place for us to begin. Psalm 51, and I say begin because I'm really going to go somewhere else um, as we as we get going here today. Psalm 51, I want to read it for you, and um, or with you. Uh, now, I've, I've known Brother Bill a long time, too. We go way, way back, and uh, so I could ask him a whole lot of things in our meeting the other day, and one thing I said, I said, now, what about the version of the Bible? Does it matter? He said, oh, I read from all of them, different ones. I said, well, good. I won't jump around a lot, but I do want to use a different one, a little bit different this morning. I want to read today from the New um, Living Translation, because I think it'll help me with what I want to do and where I want to go with the study. Now, I'm not used to all this fancy technical stuff, so if I mess up, just don't pay attention. We'll just quit and go away about it, all right? But I do want to share, talk today about this subject, clogged churches and ho-hum hearts. Clogged churches and ho-hum hearts. 
Look with me now at Psalm 51, and uh, we'll begin reading with verse number 10. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would move in our midst today. I thank you for your word, the powerful word of God that is so real and so relevant. And Lord, I pray that you would speak through it today, through the power of your Holy Spirit to each of us in the building. And that God, we'd have the opportunity, that we would have the burden to fall on our knees before you this day. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I know that your pastor has already talked with you a lot about revival, and I know that he's already probably talked about what revival is, how we have revival, all of the things that have prepared us for this moment, and I'm grateful for that. And I know that he spent a lot of time dealing with those things, and I suppose he's probably asked you this question, but at risk of being a little redundant, I want to ask you again. Do you need revival? You don't have to tell me out loud. Do you need revival? You meaning you personally, right? Sometimes we think of a revival as a church thing, and revival is a church thing, but you've got to remember we are the church. <laughs> and, and so before the church can have revival, I need revival. But do you need revival? And I, I know the answer to that before I even ask, because we just do. Even King David, even King David, maybe the greatest figure, I don't know, some would argue Moses, but, but maybe Abraham, but one of the great figures in the Old Testament, King David, a man after God's own heart, right? But the man who was known for killing his thousands in winning the kingdom for Israel, the one who was reminded as the little shepherd boy who went up to the giant and said, if God delivered the, the bear and the lion over to me, you're nothing, and, and slew the, Goliath, the, the giant Goliath. The, that man, the man after God's own heart, needed revival. You know how I know? He penned that song that we just read. He penned that song after a period of time that he had contemplated the sin with Bathsheba. I don't think I have time to rehearse that, but you know that story. And you know of the great sin that clouded David's heart, the adultery with Bathsheba and then murder to cover it up. And he sat on that and sat on that until finally the prophet came, the prophet Nathan came and, and confronted him with his sin. David got under conviction of his sin, and cried out to God over that sin and said, God, I got a problem. Create in me a clean heart. I don't think it was the first time David realized it. I, I doubt it, but, but certainly it was a moment when David realized, I need revival. I'm not where I once was. I'm not where I need to be in my relationship with God. I've been hiding this sin for a year. I've been hiding this sin for a period of time, and I know that God wants me to come clean and to come up front. And so he cried out to God for a clean heart and a clean life. It reminds me of revival because that's what revival, where at least revival begins, is with a cleaning up of an unclogged or of a clogged heart, a heart that has been clogged with sin, a heart that is that has clogged that flow of God's Spirit into our life. Now let's just agree to be honest this week, okay? Let's just don't wear our church faces. Let's just be let's agree to be honest because then our church faces say, "Oh me, I never have any problem with sin." Oh, me? I never have any problem with... I don't need revival. You don't understand who I am. No, no, no. Let's just take all those faces off, and let's just be honest and admit and, and say, okay, yes, there are times when our hearts feel clogged. There are, aren't there times when you think, I'm not sure my prayer's getting above the ceiling? Yeah. No, but, but take your church faces off now. It's okay. <laughs> but think for a minute. Sometimes, isn't there sometimes when you feel like you know there's a God, you know He's present, and yet He feels so far away? And, and there's times when you get discouraged. There's times when you get faint-hearted. There's times when we who have the living water of Christ living in us still feel like that it's been clogged. By, you ever had a clogged drain? Has your heart ever felt that way? Sure it has. I think David's did. 
So he said, God, I need you to come and cleanse me. I need you to unclog that heart. And by the way, churches then become clogged. And the work and the ministry and the service and, and all the mission of the church becomes clogged with sin. And, and as sin comes in, it clogs up the flow of everything that needs to be done. In fact, Paul put it this way. Paul said that clogged up sin or sin in our life grieves the Spirit of God and quenches the Spirit of God. What's, what quenches? It's kind of like bending a, a, a water hose, right? Or getting that, just stopping that flow. My prayer for this week is that the water of God's Spirit begins to flow freely, again, in our hearts and in this place. Now, I'm sure there's some coming. Now, Brother Bill did share with me the other day that he thinks revival's already started, which is good, which means there's some flow coming. But how many would like, instead of a trickle, an outpouring? So all of this made me think. I, I was thinking about this, and God was speaking to my heart about it. And, and this talk about clogging brought me to the point of thinking what we really need is for God to break through that clog so that the Spirit of God can flow freely. And it made me think about one of my pl favorite places to travel in Israel. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel before, and I know right now you don't want to go there. Um, I had a trip, actually, back in February. We were going, and uh, for obvious reasons, we didn't go. Um, but I've been to Israel many, many times, and one of my favorite places to go is in the old city of Jerusalem at the, at the city of David. It hasn't been unearthed very long. It's a fairly new archaeological find. I went to Israel many times to Jerusalem without ever getting to go there, but they have uncovered much of the city of David. It was at the southern part of the city of Jerusalem, and, um, and, but it was an upper part. So I don't want to get off on that too much. But one of my favorite places is to visit there, and to see David's palace and to see a lot of the things that happened in the life of David. But my favorite place is a place called Hezekiah's Tunnel. Have any of you heard of Hezekiah's Tunnel? Uh, I hadn't either for a long time. I had studied Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament major, Brother Bill, and I, I, I really didn't know about Hezekiah's Tunnel. Is that in the Bible? Yeah, it is. And we're going to go there in a minute. I'm going to show you. But Hezekiah's Tunnel is an amazing place, one of my favorite places now to go. Beth will tell you, I, I, I'm all excited about, yeah, I'm excited about seeing the Sea of Galilee and all the other stuff. But Hezekiah's Tunnel, now that's an adventure. Why? Because Hezekiah's Tunnel is an engineering masterpiece. Seventh century, right? Uh, uh, seventh century, they, they, they dug this tunnel. They started it in, in the northern part of the city, and they dug through solid rock 1,700 feet to a pool. Now, what makes it amazing is because they were pressed, and I'll show you why in a moment, because they were pressed for time, they started with one crew at the top, one crew at the bottom, and they met. How did they do that? I couldn't do that today. But now engineers can, right? I understand that, and I understand today that's probably not that big of a deal. But at that time, what a feat. People are still trying to figure out, debate still trying to figure out how they managed to meet in the middle. Some believe they followed a natural crack. Some believe that they were following some water tracers. I don't know, but they met in the middle. And what's amazing is that there's an inscription at the place that they meet the, the cave gets taller, the tunnel gets taller. So obviously, they didn't meet perfectly. Uh, we can give them that, though, right? I mean, hey, at, least, at least they met. Uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a, de a vast difference in the size, maybe 100 feet or more that they, they went up before they finally met. And at that place where they met, there's an inscription that dates all the way back to the time of Hezekiah that validates this is how it's Hezekiah's tunnel. But it says in that inscription, what's really fascinating is it says that as they got close, as they drew closer and closer and closer, they finally got close enough. Because now remember, 100 feet difference. How did, they, how did they figure? As they got closer, they could hear each other talking. Men on one side, on the other side, they could hear the pickaxes coming. And as these pickaxes got closer and they began to shout to each other, they heard each other until finally... They broke through the rock, and the tunnel was completed. That's fascinating. And you can walk through that tunnel today. We've walked through it several times. 
took a few times for me to convince Beth to go. But she finally got convinced and went. And so we will walk through that tunnel today. But now you say, what does that have to do with us? It has everything to do. And I hope you're as excited as I am by the time we finish, all right? Let me show you Hezekiah's tunnel in the scriptures. And let me tell you why I think it's important for us to hear this morning. Turn with me now to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles and chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and you read about Hezekiah's tunnel. All right? I'll tell you what. Y'all, most of y'all have your Bibles. Would it matter to y'all if I don't do this thing? Maybe I should. I'll try to do it so you can follow. Here's what it says. It says, after Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, I don't have time to talk about what this work is, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. Now that's a big deal and don't let that pass you by. King Sennacherib of Assyria, major world power, largest army in the world, right? And they're invading Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. All right? And so we have to get this picture. Sennacherib has come. He's taken all places around the world. He finally makes it to Judah. Not to Jerusalem yet, but to Judah. Hezekiah is king of Israel, and he's in Jerusalem. Right? Watch what happens. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib also intended to attack Jerusalem, he knew he was coming. Hezekiah wasn't dumb. He consulted with his officials and military advisors, and they decided to stop the flow of the springs outside the city. Let me pause there a moment. So Hezekiah knows that Sennacherib is coming. And as he contemplates a plan, they said, what do we have to do? We have to prepare because they're going to lay siege. Does everybody know what it means to lay siege to a city? It's not like our modern warfare. They didn't have rocks, uh, uh, rockets. They didn't have missiles. They didn't have grenades. They, uh, they didn't have bombs. And so what they would often do is the army, especially one as large as Sennacherib's, would, would circle around the city. And the people would go inside the city walls. It was the only place that was safe. And they would go inside the city walls, and the army would wait them out. How long before they run out of food? How long before they run out of water? Sooner or later... They're going to be starving, and they're going to come out. They couldn't penetrate the walls, and so the army would be there. Well, in Jerusalem at the time, I tell you guys, i got to come down here. Are you all okay with that? I just, I, I can't help it. So I, I was fighting it so much, I thought I might as well. Oh, I forgot about the camera. Is that going to mess it up? You're right. I'll come up here. Uh, you can follow me okay? All right, great. So, so here's the way, so, so what he did, he said, now here's what's going to happen, guys. He said, Sennacher is going to surround our city. We're walled up really well. So that's not an issue. But the problem is they're going to go around our city and they're going to try their best to starve us out. Now the problem is the only water source in Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, is the Gihon Springs, right? And the Gihon Springs, it means to gush forward. That's the word it means in Hebrew. Gush forward. It was a humongous, humongous set of, uh, of springs. And it was wonderful. It flooded down into the Kidron Valley, all the, uh, took care of all the crops, all the farmlands, all the gardens. It was a wonderful flowing river. The problem was it was outside the city, outside the walls. He said, what's going to happen is we're going to be shut up inside these walls with no water. Sennacherib's army is going to be all around us, and they're going to have plenty of water. They'll be able to stay there forever. Why don't we stop the flow of the springs outside the city? Let's stop up Gihon. It's what they said. Oh, what a brilliant plan. Except all that does is keeps the king, Sennacherib's army, from water. It doesn't help them to get water. So they organized, verse 4, they organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields, where they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and find plenty of water? Makes sense, right? But then he did something else. He blocked up the upper spring of Gihon and brought the water down through a tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Oh, what a brilliant guy. He says, I know what we'll do. We'll stop up the springs. We'll hide the springs. And they'll never know they're there. And rather than having the natural little river that ran out to the gardens, he said, we'll stop that up and we'll funnel down through a tunnel. And I can hear his advisors are saying, King Hezekiah, 
has a wonderful idea. There's only one problem we see. What's that? There's no tunnel. <laughs> what are we going to do? And we've only got maybe a couple of years. Maybe. Can we do it? So that's why they started with one at one end and one at the other. Because they knew they had limited time. And so the report is, verse 30, he succeeded in everything that he did. Oh, how did that get there? That's me and Beth going into Hezekiah's tunnel. I'll put that in there because I want you to get an idea of what this tunnel is like. Now, this is just outside. This is where it meets with a dry tunnel that they used to get to the spring. But they closed it off, and then they built this tunnel. I also put it there to just show how brave my wife is. I just thought you needed to know that. So that's Hezekiah's tunnel. I think it is critical to understand that story. And you're thinking, well, why in the world, and what does it have to do with any of us? I think it's pretty important for several reasons. Hezekiah knew that if something didn't change, they were doomed. Something had to change. If things didn't change, they were going to die. Well, that's a pretty serious realization. And I feel like that it's something that we need to hear and that we need to think through as we think about revival. Revival comes, I believe, when we get to the point that we are desperate enough to understand some things that this tunnel teaches us. The first thing I think it teaches us is that revival starts with realizing there's a problem. King Sennacherib is coming. We got a problem. If we don't get ready, if we don't prepare, we die. Now, now friends, listen to me carefully. I'm not an alarmist. But I do believe with all my heart that we have to come to realize we have a problem. We have problems today. We have problems in our nations. In our nation, we, 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 there's, all kind, there's more division. There, there's more um, um, greed. There, there, you must just go down the list. We, we just got problems in our nation. But you know what? We've got problems in our neighborhoods too, right? We can't just look at Washington. I want to look at Washington and blame all the, them. I started to call them something, but I won't since I'm here. Uh, I, I, we got problems in our nation, but we got problems in our neighborhoods. A, a lot of people in our neighborhoods, we don't, we don't know anymore. We don't know about their relationship with the, with the Lord. Are they saved? Are they not saved? Uh, is, is, what's our responsibility to Him? How do, how do, I, I, I'm praying. I might talk tonight about neighbors. I, I might. I, I'm still praying that through. So you can pray for me about that. But I know this. Revival starts when we realize there's a problem. Revival starts in my heart when I realize there's a problem. Let's just get it off of Washington now. Let me get it on me again. Because I know that revival in my heart has to begin with realizing there's a problem. Sometimes our greatest weakness is not recognizing our weakness. We, we, don't real, we, we just think everything's okay with me. Everything's all right with my, my life, with my spiritual life. Everything's all right between me and Jesus. I mean, I'm good. I don't know about you, Pastor, but I'm good. Nothing's wrong with our church. Everything's great. Everything's good. Listen, there, never is it everything good, right? Come on, don't tell me your church is perfect because I know the people that make it up, right? And, and I don't mean personally, I don't have to, because I just know that we're not perfect. I tell my church all the time, listen, if you're looking for a perfect church, don't find it. You'll just mess it up, right? Don't join it. And if, if you're looking for a perfect church, you, you, you don't have it here because it starts with the pastor. I am not perfect. And there's times when I realize that I have this, this need. That I don't recognize where's God's presence. I don't sense God's presence. I don't sense his power. What's going on? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe there's a problem with Eddie that I need to check out, right? Revival starts with realizing there's a problem. You have to be willing to acknowledge in your life, in your heart, that there's a problem. Same with the church. Second thing I think it teaches us, very important, 
We don't need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough. <laughs> All right? A little play on words. You know, sometimes we need a breakthrough. Breakthrough usually means what? Something new. We need something new, right? And what a breakthrough. You know, we have a scientific breakthrough, or we have an engineering breakthrough, or we have a whatever breakthrough, a new idea, what a breakthrough, and we need a church, and we need a breakthrough. No, we need to break through some things. That's, that's what we need. A little bit of a play on words, but I think it's very important, because like Hezekiah, we need to unstop the river of living water. Oh, I forgot to tell you something important about that water, that, that tunnel. Is, is that tunnel then, once they had it drawn, once they had it come together, then they could go up to the top of it where they had dammed up the springs, they break through that, and what happens? The water comes gushing down. Wow, can you imagine that moment when they were there hotter, they've been talking to each other, and then suddenly they break through? And suddenly they see faces of their friends. And suddenly the water begins to trickle and then trickle and then trickle. And then there's a steady stream. By the way, when we walk through that tunnel, you still walk through the water. The water is still flowing. It flows down to a pool. The pool is called Siloam. Have you read about that in the Gospels? Remember the pool of Siloam where the people would jump in? Well, that's from the Gihon. And so those waters would flow down. And guess what's special about the Pool of Siloam? It's inside the city gates. So, wow! Now, we have water. The army doesn't. I think we can outlast them. But we, knew God, we know God, and we know he didn't need that. He, we know God fell in another different way. That's another sermon another time. But suffice it to say this. I'm pretty sure that it was an amazing moment when that break the water broke through that little opening and began to flow. I can hear those people shouting, can't you? I can hear it echoing in the wells, in, in the tunnel there. I can hear it as it's being echoed all around. And the people are just shouting because we have water. What a breakthrough. Wouldn't it be pretty cool if sometime this week we could just start shouting in here because something, is, something has broken through, the Spirit of God has broken through. Man, if we could just have a time when the Spirit of God would break through some of the clogs in the clogged up church, wouldn't it be amazing if we could see the Spirit of God moving and flowing like never before? Wouldn't it be incredible if we could just see God's presence so powerfully as the Spirit of God unclogs our hearts, our hard, Jesus even said that some people have hard, rocky hearts, right? You remember when he was talking about the sower, the parable of the sower? He said, some of your hearts are hard. And you need the Spirit of God to break through and unclog that hard heart. But then he also said some of your hearts are crowded. You remember? He said he talked about the, 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 the seed where the was planted and the weeds came up and choked out the Word. You know what? It don't have to be solid rock to be clogged. Sometimes you just get clogged with too much stuff in the line. It's too crowded. Man, if the Spirit of God... I'm praying that God break through those parts of my heart that are just hard like rock. And I'm praying this week that the Spirit of God will break through those parts of my heart that are crowded. Just too much stuff. Too much stuff. We don't have time for God anymore. We don't have time for revival anymore. You know this is very rare what you're doing this week? It's very rare. To be honest with you, I used to preach revivals a lot. Not much anymore. We don't have time, do we? Like Hezekiah, we need to allow the Spirit of God to chip away at our hearts and let the flow of God's Spirit really begin to work. There's only one other thing that I have. The waters of revival come from the Lord, but we're not free from responsibility. And can I just say that? I understand that the Spirit of God is the source of revival, not me, not Brother Bill. The Spirit of God is the source of revival, but we are not free of responsibility. God took care of Sennacherib and his army, right? But he let them dig that tunnel. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have walked through that tunnel many times. That was not an easy chore. I wish I'd have brought another picture to show you because as you walk through that tunnel, 
you easily touch the walls because they're about it's about this wide you can touch the ceiling because it's just above your head at times you're crouching down to get through it and you know what you as you touch those walls you know what you feel you can feel today the marks from the pickaxes where they chipped away chipped away chipped away you touch those and they're like ridges all the way down the sides of the walls it's like ridges on the top you can see where they pickaxe their way through it's why i put that picture up there in the beginning i'm pretty sure that was not easy you ever used one of those things we used to when i was uh, early in ministry we used to um pour concrete for churches as part of our mission work and we had several people who knew concrete and and um they they um they gave their time and so we would pour churches pour concrete for churches and all over and i remember i was very young then i could do that kind of thing and i loved doing that kind of thing one year we went up to north dakota on a trip um because there was a church up there i don't know how familiar you are but that is mission country up there and and we would go up there and we planted we were going to pour a, a slab for a church it was building a new building in the town the only church in the in the town it was incredible we went up there and the plan was they were going to have everything kind of ready and for us to pour and we'd come pour the they do all the pre the the preset work and then we we just come in and pour the concrete when we got there none of the plumbing was in and so we decided well we'll do it so we get our shovels and we're ready to dig hmm we forgot we were not in florida they said oh by the way you need to know that the freeze line here is 10 feet now it took me a while to figure that out that means we got to dig 10 feet into the ground and the ground was solid rock no shovels pickaxes maybe that's what influences me when i walk through hezekiah's tunnel and feel those little things my point waters of revival come from the lord but we're not free from responsibility we have certain responsibilities we have to be prepared you've been preparing for weeks your pastor has certain responsibilities i've been preparing for several weeks i've got certain responsibilities i have a responsibility to make sure that i'm ready to listen to god and hear what god wants to preach rather than what i want to preach can i just tell you let's just be honest i'm going to tell you what brother bill won't tell you there's just some sermons that are more fun to preach than others can i just say that and i, I don't want to do that i want to listen to what god has for us that's my responsibility. Now, I know that God is not depending on me, <laughs> but I'm not without responsibility. You're not without responsibility either. You've been praying. Don't stop now. <laughs> you say, well, after we heard you, I think we're going to double up our prayer time. That'll be all right. That'll be okay. Don't stop now. You have to make some commitments. You have to decide, I want to be a part of this. I want to see what God wants to do. Because here's what I know. And here's what I'm asking from you. I'm asking you to begin today admitting your need for a revival. Not our need. You've been praying about our need, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure y'all have talked about that. But have you started praying for my need? Or I need revival. I'm just going to be honest with you. There's just some places that I feel like the water has slowed to a trickle. And it's clogged up. And by the way, clogged up churches and clogged up hearts result in ho-hum hearts. You know what I mean? Ho-hum. It's Sunday. Church day. We go to church. We're going to hear the message. We're going to listen to some songs, sing some songs. We're going to go to lunch. That's the best part. <laughs> oh oh hum hearts need revival clogged hearts clogged churches need revival second i'm asking you to believe god wants to break through your fill in the blank that's different for every one of us so i don't even want to say we i'm asking you to believe that god wants to break through your fill in the blank and third I'm going to ask you to commit to absolute surrender and absolute trust. Ask God to receive your full surrender.
Because I think if I were to give you something to just take away from this day, this message, it might be this thought. Full surrender secures a breakthrough. Full surrender is what secures a breakthrough. Y'all with me? Of course I'm asking you to come back tonight. Of course I'm asking you to come back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I understand life goes on and you may not be able to. But I also know I'm expecting God to work all week long. The biggest, one of the biggest moments in my life spiritually was when I realized that God operates Monday through Saturday as well as he does on Sunday. (laughs) Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time together. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for the power of your word. And Father, I thank you that you're always faithful to show up. And God, as we turn now to this very important moment of just contemplating what you've said, considering the things that have challenged our hearts, God, would you move right now to break through strongholds, to break through clogs in our life, to break through hindrances to our growth. God, I pray that this will be a week of breaking through. That is the Holy Spirit breaking through into our lives. Now, just before we sing, I want to ask a question. Your head's bowed. Has God spoken to you this morning? I trust He has. I am not about entertainment. God has spoken into your heart. If he has, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to respond? Pray we are. For the bill has come and he's going to be here to receive you, to pray with you. I'll be up here. I'll be happy to pray with you. Anything we can pray about. I don't know what your custom, your manner is, but I see a kneeling bench over there. I'm, su- I'm suspectful that that's for an altar of a praying time or these front rows of these benches are open or maybe you just need to be at your seat that's okay too but let's open the door to the Holy Spirit of God and ask him to break through in a mighty way amen and amen what are we singing brother